I'm gonna ask you a question and I want you to answer truthfully in the comment section below. Who is the first person that you picture when you hear the words President of the United States and why? Is it Biden or Trump because they're in the news constantly? Is it Washington or Jefferson because they're our founding fathers? It might even be Teddy Roosevelt because he's in the title of this video. But some of you may have said Lincoln or Kennedy because among other things, they're famous for dying at the hands of assassins during their presidencies. What about a president who survives his assassination attempt and does so while breaking away from his party and running against his handpicked successor for an unprecedented third term as president? This is a story of how Teddy Roosevelt survived. Before we keep going, I just wanted to ask you to like and subscribe. The JFK video I put out last week did really, really well. That video took the channel to 100 subscribers, and since then we've already hit 150, which is crazy. I appreciate all the support. I also want to clarify that I'm not a historian by any means, and while I try my best, this channel is a one-man operation and I'm still fairly new at it, so sometimes I might get some things wrong. If that's the case, just leave a comment below and I'd be happy to make a correction. Theodore Roosevelt might have the strangest mythology of any American president. There's no denying the man exudes a personality that's larger than life with his great presence and countless achievements. Even Roosevelt's assassination attempt adds to his mythology as a true man's man. Theodore Roosevelt was born in 1958 to a prominent New York family that had an enormous amount of wealth. Roosevelt would fight in the Spanish-American War as a rough rider in Cuba, which allowed him to gain a lot of recognition in the United States. During this campaign, there rose to prominence Theodore Roosevelt and his famous rough riders. Ironically enough, Teddy himself only became president because of another assassination. President William McKinley was elected in 1894 alongside his vice president, Garrett Hobart. But Hobart would die in 1899, leaving the office vacant for the election of 1900. At the time, Roosevelt was a rising star serving as the popular governor of New York, pushing through a progressive platform. One of Roosevelt's fellow Republicans, Thomas Platt, disliked the larger-than-life governor and the reforms he brought to the state. This led Platt to advocate for Roosevelt as the new pick for vice president so he could push him out of the governor's office. Obviously, Roosevelt didn't want to be vice president because being vice president sucks, but so many people wanted him that McKinley pretty much just went and chose him anyway. As you and I both know, Roosevelt's life was about to change forever. Together, the McKinley-Roosevelt ticket would win the election and cement McKinley as the most popular president in the history of the world. Yeah, no, I'm just joking around. McKinley would be assassinated only eight months into his second term as president. Today, he's a mostly forgotten figure and he's wildly overshadowed by his successor. William McKinley might be gone, but Teddy Roosevelt survives. When McKinley was assassinated at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, he became the chief executive. Suddenly, Theodore Roosevelt was president and he understood the assignment. At just 41 years old, Roosevelt still holds the record for the youngest president ever sworn in. Here we have the trust-busting strongman president that wanted to break up monopolies, expand the American empire, and preserve our natural beauty. Let's face it, Teddy Roosevelt, cool guy. Very compelling character, and it's easy just to focus on the positives, but there's more to it than that. A product of his time, Roosevelt was quite the racist. And despite being a great progressive on a lot of issues, Roosevelt supported eugenics. While he saw white men as inherently superior, Roosevelt did believe that certain stand-up members of minority races could rise above the constraints of their people. This explains how he became the first president to invite a black person to the White House when he met with Booker T. Washington in 1901. We can examine both the folk hero-esque nature of Roosevelt and how cool of a figure he is, while also acknowledging his shortcomings and beliefs that today are seen as abhorrent because they're all part of who he was. Roosevelt finished the remainder of McKinley's term and went on to be elected himself in 1904 with 336 electoral votes compared to his challenger's measly 140. In 1904, Theodore Roosevelt was re-elected president. His restlessness and modern energy enabled him to direct the successful construction of the Panama Canal, so vital to our two ocean defense, after France and Spain abandoned the task as hopeless. In his two terms as president of the United States, he was a champion of progressivism in the environment while also advocating for the expansion of the American empire. After the 1908 election and two successful terms, Roosevelt left office and handed the presidency off to his chosen successor, William Howard Taft. Then he went home and retired to a happy and peaceful life. Nah, I'm just kidding. This is Theodore Roosevelt, and boy, would he regret leaving the presidency. In 1908, William Howard Taft was elected president. He was not so strenuously progressive as Roosevelt. However, during his administration, 
the Postal Savings Bank was created. Taft ended up being a lot more conservative than Roosevelt had expected, something that the great progressive Rough Rider himself absolutely would not tolerate. Frustrated by the Taft administration, and frankly, I think a little bored, Roosevelt decided to run again for the Republican nomination in the election of 1912. Roosevelt won 411 delegates, beating Taft's 367, while minor candidates won only 46. At this point, no candidate reached the 540 delegates needed to win the nomination. The Republican National Committee was in charge of distributing the remaining 254 delegates. But Taft was still the president, and the committee was filled with a lot of his conservative supporters. The committee awarded Taft 235 delegates, while only awarding Roosevelt 19. Of course, Teddy wasn't happy about this, and he contested the results, saying he was entitled to 75 more delegates. Roosevelt was furious. He felt that he had been chosen by the people and saw this as the conservative party machine taking away his rightful victory. But he wasn't just going to let it slide. In August of that year, he would declare his candidacy under his new progressive Bull Moose Party. The year is 1912, and we have three men who would all become president in their lifetimes running against each other for the office. Of course, the election was about to get a lot more exciting. On October 14th of 1912, Teddy Roosevelt was in a Milwaukee hotel getting ready to give a campaign speech when suddenly the former president was shot by a man named John Schrank. Schrank claimed that he had a dream where the ghost of William McKinley told him to assassinate Roosevelt. Needless to say, Schrank was deemed insane as presidential assassins tend to be. Roosevelt had a case for his glasses and a copy of his very long speech in his jacket pocket, which helped slow down the bullet. Roosevelt coughed in an attempt to see whether or not his lungs were bleeding, and when he saw that they weren't, he went on and gave his speech anyway, despite the advice of everyone around him. The former president read his speech for over an hour, making various references to the fact that he had just been shot. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you fully understand that I have just been shot, but it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. This is an insane situation, and it's honestly really impressive. Could you imagine if you were at a campaign rally and the candidate got shot beforehand and they showed up and they just kept talking anyway? If Roosevelt wasn't perceived as a tough guy before, he definitely was now. The president's doctor concluded that it was best not to remove the bullet, so Roosevelt continued to have it lodged in his chest for the rest of his life. Now the question is, how did the assassination attempt affect the election? Woodrow Wilson would absolutely sweep the Electoral College with a staggering 435 votes, the most of any president up to that point. But how did a sitting president and a popular former president both lose to Woodrow Wilson? Well, unfortunately for Roosevelt and Taft, the answer is that Roosevelt's third party candidacy divided the Republican vote. The Electoral College is a winner take all system. So whoever wins the most votes in a state wins all of that state's electoral votes. For example, let's look at Wilson's home state of New Jersey. Wilson won the state with a total of 178,000 votes. Roosevelt came in second with 145,000 and Taft came in third with 88,000. Let's say hypothetically, Roosevelt had been the nominee. If even half the people who voted for Taft came out to vote for Roosevelt instead, he would have won New Jersey by a margin that makes a lot more sense. In the national total, Wilson won 41.8% of the popular vote. If you add Roosevelt's 27.4% and Taft's 23.2%, it equals 50.6%, which is more than Wilson's. Of course, this is history, and it's easy to speculate about what would have happened if things went differently. At the end of the day, you can't assume that everyone who voted for Taft would have voted for Roosevelt or vice versa. Although Roosevelt didn't win re-election, he did have the highest third party showing in American history, which certainly added to his image in American mythology. Not to mention the fact that he got shot while doing it. Some people say that if Roosevelt hadn't needed to take a break after his assassination attempt, that he would have been able to beat Wilson in the election, but I honestly find that really unlikely because of the vote splitting that I mentioned earlier. Even Roosevelt and Taft's combined electoral votes don't add up to very much. It is interesting, however, to speculate about how Roosevelt would have handled the First World War. During Wilson's first term, Roosevelt begged for the United States to join the war as a way to show off its great military might and prove itself on the world stage as a superpower. While this wasn't a very popular position at the time, Roosevelt would end up being right about how the United States joining the First World War would cement its position among the strongest nations on Earth. As a vocal critic of Wilson, Roosevelt remained a popular figure in American politics. 
The former head of the Roosevelt Association, John Allen Gable, suggested that Roosevelt was preparing to run for the Republican nomination once again in 1920. However, Roosevelt would pass away on January 6, 1919, at the young age of just 60 years old. His last words were to his chauffeur, James, will you please put out the light? Regardless on how you feel about him, regardless of his assassination attempt and electoral loss, President Theodore Roosevelt was a headstrong man who captivated the American people during his time and continues to be a symbol of strength and endurance in American culture to this day. Hello again, this is Andre from the Editing Bay. I originally recorded this part of the video with the rest of it, but in post-production I realized that the audio was all messed up, so here I am. I want to leave you with the question, what's your favorite story of something that a president did after their time in office was over? Today we talked about Roosevelt's assassination attempt, and I would love to hear what you guys have to say. Let me know in the comment section below because I absolutely love the conversational aspect of this and hearing what you guys have to say.